and inefficient and not helping the workplace dynamic, I do. And I know the place in my mind that leads me to behave in that way. And so empathy is opened up. And hopefully on top of empathy, then compassion. When we're not self-aware, we just judge. I don't know why people do that. And as soon as we say, I don't know why people do that, also compassion is thrown out the door. Yeah? Do you mind if I ask, how, how, do, you, how, do, you, how do you show compassion to someone who doesn't have these self-awareness of that they're leaching out yeah. negative? <laughs> well, if we had to wait for everyone to be self-aware, we'd be waiting a long time, right? Yeah, yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, you know, yeah, if we had to wait for everyone to switch a light on before we could have compassion, we'd never have compassion, right? Because we're all kind of turning the light on, turning the light off. Switch, 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 right? Self-aware, less self-aware. Self-aware, less self-aware. Depending on, like, what we've eaten that day, right? How much sleep we've gotten, how much training and introspection has been in our life. Um, so what we're trying to do with having compassion for the particularly unaware is to try and remember those snapshots in time when we've been that guy, right? When we've been the one that just hurt people and created chaos, probably unintentionally, just because of distraction, lack of awareness. We didn't even mean to. And yet, we did cause harm. We said something careless and someone was hurt. We didn't mean to hurt them, but they were hurt. And to think, this person who right now I'm frustrated because they don't have self-awareness and they don't see how they're hurting others, this person shows me how not to be in myself. They're this perfect mirror. And if I didn't have people like this in my life, I would forget how awful it is and might let myself slip back into bad habits again. Thank you, difficult person, <laughs> right? You know, and it's, it's, it's tricky because you don't want it to get plastic and weird and inauthentic, right? It's like you're not pretending that the awful behavior isn't awful. You're saying that is awful, which is great, right? Which is different than just going, it's great, it's great, it's fine, it's fine. Everything's a teaching, la, la, la. It's not that, right? It's saying, no, this is really hard work. This person is really hard work. This person is really difficult. This person is causing harm. Wonderful, <laughs> right? So it's this intermediate step which is able to just sit for a minute with the fact that there are some tough people out there. There really are, right? We know them. We're related to some of them, right? Maybe married to a couple, who knows, right? But there are tricky people out there. And these tricky people, we don't have to pretend aren't tricky or think it's all my fault because I can't deal with it because I don't have a strong enough mind. That's not useful, right? But what's useful is to look at what would it take for me to behave that way? Right? What would it take for me to get to that state? How much suffering would I have to be under? How much ignorance would I have to have for me to behave that way? Right? Because the quickest way to kill your compassion is to not relate. Yeah? Isn't it? Right? As soon as you don't relate, you usually don't have compassion. And the thing about compassion is the other person doesn't have to appreciate it for it to still kind of work. Because the first thing having compassion does is it settles your mind. When you have compassion for someone else, they're not irritating you. Yeah? When, you, when you're filled with compassion, irritation can't get in. And so you're just there fine, you know, with your compassion and leaking compassion. And they're either receptive to that or they aren't. But the first job is done, which is their agitation hasn't triggered your agitation. Yeah, so the first job is done. And then the second job of how can I get through to this person, you have to take it case by case because for some people there's roads in and some people there aren't. And in any case, we're going to be the most skillful if we are calm. Right? So, you know, these different ways of playing with how did I get agitated by this situation, this person, this circumstance? What was it that I did to myself to get so worked up? And is it helping? <laughs> but still keeping that sense of humor and that awareness of the human condition that, just like me, everyone reacts unskillfully, 
just like me, everyone is a product of their conditions and their history. I don't have to feel fault when I make mistakes. I just take responsibility. And they're very different things, fault and responsibility. It's not your fault, but it is your responsibility. Because whose else is it? Who's responsible for your happiness? Right? As soon as you say, the person next to me, you've disempowered yourself. You've given up all of your power. Right? As soon as you've said, this kind of job, this kind of house, this kind of whatever is what I need for happiness, you've given it all the power for your happiness, and you can't be happy without it. You know, whose fault is that, right? It's tricky. So it's our responsibility, but if we can really let go of kind of critical ideas towards ourselves, because if you kind of whip yourself into mind training or try to whip yourself out of attachment and aversion and sort of like tightly discipline yourself, you'll do really well for about a day, and then you'll trigger an inner rebellion and be even worse than before because that kind of pressure isn't good for us and it's not sustainable. Yeah, so if you're trying to be really good <laughs> in a tight way, you will pop a fuse, right? Um, so just very gently with a sense of humor, but also with this, I am not alone. If I can kind of figure out this particular dynamic or situation, I'm gonna be in a much better position to be of benefit to others. I'm going to be a better friend, a better partner, a better coworker, better everything if I work out my own responses. Because in working out my own responses, I'm understanding the human condition. Even if others behave differently than me, I'll have a deep knowing. So just really gently. And you don't start with your like most problematic person first, right? Pick with the kind of like mid-range annoying person, <laughs> right? That just kind of mildly annoys you. And kind of play with your mind of what what would happen if I decided this person was valuable to me? That they were a perfect mirror for me to see how conditional my love is. Don't pick your worst enemy. Wait, you know, that's, you know, advanced master class sort of business. Yeah, but, you know, pick a, a mildly annoying person in your life and they are your project. Yeah. So, okay, so gain and loss. Um, the attachment related to gain and loss, I think, I think we get how that disturbs our peace, right? There's also this idea that losing something is necessarily suffering, right? If you lose what you love, you have to suffer. It's the rule, right? And yet, has there ever been a time when you've lost something and were actually kind of liberated, not having to look after it anymore? Yeah? <laughs> or them. <laughs> 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 your choice. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I mean, it is, it's interesting. So what you're trying to do is to say pleasure and pain, gain and loss are not good or bad from their own side. They are conditions. And to say they are conditions mean they do exist as conditions, but they are not the main cause of how I'm feeling. The main cause is my mind. Let me take the power back. Yeah. Okay, so then the next one is more tricky because it's a, more specifically to do with other people, right? The first four, you know, can be more material, can be more individual, less related to others, but this next set is about criticism and praise. So the assumption that we often operate with is that criticism is bad and that praise is good. Right? Generally speaking, if we don't examine it too much, if we don't engage our wisdom, just moving around a day, we'd rather not be criticized, we would rather be validated. Yeah? If someone says, you look amazing, that's better than them saying, you look terrible. Right? <laughs> what is wrong with you? Right? If someone says, you're an amazing, efficient worker, you're incredibly competent, you're like, ping! Right? And if they say, oh, you're so inefficient, you never get anything done, you're a terrible communicator, we're like, right? Generally speaking, right, if we don't unpack it. And that knee-jerk way of reacting can be unpacked very simply by remembering, why do you criticize? Why do you praise? When you criticize, 
is it always coming from a place of, gee, I'm going to help this person become a better person by showing a very gentle light on a few small areas where they could gently improve coming to their fullest potential. I'm just going to speak it in a really gentle way and just kind of help them on their journey. Or do you think, they're annoying me, right? When you're critical, why are you critical? Part of you might think, oh, I'm helping, but unpack it a little deeper. Maybe 2% of the time you criticize, it's because you genuinely want to help, and the rest of the time, you're just being mean, <laughs> right? Especially when you're criticizing to a third party. You might call it workshopping, processing, venting, right? When in fact, it's just whinging, right? It's just whining. Yeah, trying to get attention for yourself or trying to make someone else look bad or feel bad. That's a lot of what criticism is. We don't feel great, so we're going to take it out on someone else and make them not feel great. Sometimes we're trying to help. Sometimes we're thinking, what's the most skillful way I can show this person a le the way they're being a little bit less effective than they could be? And just gently, gently try and bring out the best in them. Sometimes we criticize that way, but probably not usually. We're coming from a suffering place when we criticize, not a happy place most of the time. And so if someone is criticizing you, are they happy? <laughs> you can say, OK, maybe 2% of the time, they genuinely see a fault that they genuinely want to help me with from a genuine place of love. And the rest of the time, they're just having a bad day, and I'm in front of them. Do we need to suffer because of that or be angry because of that? Or can we look underneath what drove that criticism and say, that was not a happy person who said that. May you be well. May you be happy. It does something different in your mind in terms of the agitation level. Okay? Because when we get criticized, we take such a hit. Right? It's like we've been shot with something. And we get all kind of shaky and agitated and defensive or sad and wounded. Right? All of these responses agitate the mind. And we don't usually stop and think, how come they did that? Let's, you know, let's look at what they said in a minute and see if it's true or not, see if it's useful or not. Let's take a step back and what would drive someone to say that? What's their day been? <laughs> Right? It changes your level of agitation when you realize that really very few things are personal, even when they're directed at you personally. Right? It changes that. And the same with praise. When you praise someone, is it just 100% wanting to support someone's good qualities, good abilities, um, wanting to give them a boost, or is it because you want them to like you? Is it because you want to have some sort of harmony? You don't want them to be mad. You want to soothe something. Is your praise always purely motivated, or sometimes is it tainted with self-interest? Who do you praise and why? These are the questions we want to ask ourselves, because when other people praise us, it's so easy to be manipulated by that and go, it's because I am amazing. Or you think, oh, I'm not amazing and they're going to find out, oh my god, you know, depending on your personality, right? So either way, praise is going to trigger something agitating. Like, yes, thank you for noticing, <laughs> right? Or no, 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 and they'll find me out. So, uh, you know, what we want to really look at here is we assume praise is good and needed and that we can't function without being validated every second. Was that good? Was it okay? Did I do that right? Am I good? You know, like we're a dog that needs to be patted. Yeah? Yes, you did get the ball. Good for you. Right? We're not actually a lot more sophisticated than that. Yeah? And it's poignant, right? It is poignant. And it doesn't mean we should stop praising people. We should continue to praise people, but from a more pure motivation. What we're trying to unpack here is the need to be praised in order to feel fulfilled. There's a, a mind training slogan of Geshe Chakawa which says, of the two witnesses, hold the principal one. Which means be your own witness. Is what you did good or not? You're the one that knows. Were you motivated in a good way or not? You're the one that knows. 
sometimes we're praised for things that weren't particularly amazing and things that we did that were amazing no one particularly noticed. Perhaps that was even part of its amazingness is that no one noticed it was you. Yeah, so you have to be your own witness, otherwise you're subject to this inner turmoil of need. Does it make sense? Do you, do you have some resistance coming up or some worries? Does avoiding criticism and seeking praise occur in your mind during the day? Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> do, do, do. Right. When you speak to other people, are you sometimes seeking to avoid criticism and get praise? Right. I mean, you know, in in the content of a conversation, are there often that element of please don't say I'm bad, please say I'm good, at its essence, right? It's all sort of more sophisticated on the surface, but like down at its essence, is it am I good, not bad? <laughs> <laughs> right? Often. Right? And like some feedback is useful, right? It's not to say feedback isn't useful. Sometimes it is. Sometimes we don't see our impact on others and need people to reflect. That can be useful. What we're talking about is attachment to and aversion towards that really hungry, agitated mind. Because when you're in that headspace, even if someone saw you perfectly and praised you thoroughly, it would never be enough. It wouldn't feel like enough. Right? When you're coming from a stable mind and someone says, hey, that was great today, you go, oh, good, that was great, okay, I'll do more of that, thanks. And you remember that your qualities and your skills were learned. You know, you're not thinking this big pride of I'm amazing, you're thinking, I'm glad that was useful, that thing that happened because of many conditions, yay, right? But when you're in this hungry, needy space, no matter how many people validate you and tell you you're amazing, it won't go in. Yeah, you'll keep wanting more and more specific compliments. You're like, look, I know you like my haircut, but do you like the way I did that angle there? Do you like the coloring there? You get more and more specific about your needs for compliments, right? You're like, I like that you like my clothes, but you, did you notice the thing that I did with that shirt sleeve, the way I just curled it a little bit? That was cool, wasn't it? Right, you get really specific, right? If it's a workplace thing, you can't just let it go of, yep, that project worked, well done, moving on. You need to keep harping on about it. And at every staff meeting, you're like, remember that time five years ago when I did the good project that worked really well? That was me, everyone. That was me. Yeah. Yeah. So Sally always takes credit for it, but I just let it be known. That was me. Right? That hungry, needy mind will never be satisfied. And the mind that fears criticism will be wounded by the tiniest of things. Right? Just someone glaring in your general direction. You've like taken a hit. You're like, oh my God, they don't like me. Oh my God, what did I do? Oh my God, right? You know when you get kind of neurotic like that? We have good days where it doesn't matter, right? But we certainly all have those days where just a few words of minor criticism, we crumple, yeah? Or we get really angry, yeah? And that's the mind of aversion. That's not the practical mind that's stable and able to ask, is that true or not, useful or not, right? Yeah thinking sometimes I hesitate to tell somebody in a good way like I'm afraid that it will take it be too uh, unhappy about it and that is not what I mean mm. I avoid saying it because I think maybe it will not be good for that person and like take responsible for that person which maybe is not what would happen mm. But how could you, do you understand? Yeah, are you asking, is it a good idea to ever give feedback, <laughs> good or bad? <laughs> is, it a, is it a good idea to give feedback ever? Yes, it, it, of course. Right, sometimes, right? Sometimes. How do you know when is a good time? Yeah. And, you know, because we don't have clairvoyance, we can't read each other's minds, we will never know exactly the right time to praise or criticize, even if our motivation is perfect. But if your motivation is good, you're much more likely for it to be the right time. So ask yourself, why do I want to say this? And don't stop at the surface reason, because the surface reason lies. 
it knows what you want to hear. I'm going to criticize this person because, look, they just really need to know, and maybe they'll hear it from me because I'm a nice person, and if no one tells them, maybe they'll never, la, 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 and you have all this justification, right? Listen to what is underneath that. Is it really, I think it's a value in this world to support people in their growth, or is it, they really annoyed me yesterday and this is a way to get back at them? Because sometimes there are these hidden motivations that we are too embarrassed to see. Yeah, but if it's coming from the good place, think about it and say it. And then be brave and see what happens. <laughs> right? And you're like, did it work? Oh, well. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so, um, how, you, how do you know that you're not helping them to expand their egos instead of uh, yeah. motivating You don't know. You don't know, but you can probably make an educated guess, right? Are, are you inflating their ego with your praise, or are you supporting them in good qualities? Assume it's both, right? With everyone, assume it's both. And some, you know, ego fluffing is not the end of the world, because if we had to wait for everyone to be unafflicted in order to praise them, we would never praise anyone. But if what they're doing is good and worth supporting, it might still be okay to say something like that was great. You just have to think, you know, is this part of the big picture that is good for humanity? Or is this just me in a moment of anxiety wanting things to be nice between us? So I'm going to say a nice thing so it feels nice because it's uncomfortable when it's tense and ah. You know, so you're just checking why am I doing it? Not really how is it going to land for them. It's much more important why am I doing this? And, and in this particular teaching, it's even more important to ask, why do I react this way when others do this to me? Because it does feel like they gave you suffering when they criticized you. It does. It feels like that. It feels like someone just came up and injected you with suffering when they said a mean thing. And now you have to suffer because of what they said. That's what it feels like. And that is not true. And that is a shame that we don't know that on a day-to-day -day basis, because we don't need to suffer so much. Yeah, We can sometimes even see a billboard advertising something with a person on it that is the way that we think we should be. And just seeing that feels like a criticism. Yeah, We can be criticized by things that are inanimate. right? Not even a sentient being, a billboard. right? Oh, I should look like that. Oh, I should be driving that. We, we can take these, you know, little wounds. And it's perfectly normal. We all do this. But do we have to is the question. And just because something comes naturally, does it mean that it's necessary? You know? And is it fulfilling the purpose that I want to do with this life? So that does make you have to ask the question, what do I want to do with this life? and more than my ambitions for work and my ambitions for relationships and my ambitions for property, what is the legacy I want to leave humanity, right? Because whether or not you believe in future lives, you believe life will exist after you, whether or not you are a part of it, right? So asking what is the impact I'm leaving, is it just a flat full of stuff, <laughs> right? You're welcome, right? Or, or is it some you know, lasting positive impact in your friends and family? Who are the people that you remember once they're gone and why do you remember them? Are you the sort of person that's going to leave behind a positive impact? And if you believe in future lives, what is the legacy of habits, mental habits, that you're leaving for yourself? Do you want to keep all of them? Our habits of anxiety, <laughs> right? Let's take that to the next life. Excellent, right? <laughs> or do we want to take our patience or our love, right? That's a nicer legacy. So, so I, think it's, I think it's better not to be too concerned with what other people think or respond to what we're doing. I think it's much more useful to take a step back and ask, why am I doing this? What is my motivation? And not just my surface motivation, but my deep, deep, deep motivation. And is it a motivation I want to keep? You know, and then you're just gently tweaking your personality to something more and more beneficial and more and more kind and happier, right? Um, and probably you're more useful to people as a byproduct. Um, 
I think a good example is to think about your different groups of friends, right? Lots of us have unrelated groups of friends, like maybe your work friends and your old school friends and the friends that you go do music things with, or you know, you have kind of pods of friends, right? And for in some groups of friends, you are better behaved, and some groups of friends, you are less well behaved. Do you agree? Right, just in terms of the way you speak and what you do. It's of course way more dramatic when you're very young and as you get older it kind of evens out. But like especially when you were in your like early 20s, right, there were like your partying friends and maybe your like intellectual friends, right? And sometimes they'd overlap, right? But what we're trying to unpack here is the fact that we can bring out the best in each other or bring out the worst in each other. And we're aware of the impact these groups have on us. You know, here's the friend I gossip with. Here's the friend I would never gossip with who I only talk about ideas or I only talk about politics or I only talk about ways to support my community. And then here's the friend that I whinge about all the different people who annoy me and why. Right? You have, you know, different kinds of friends, right? So what is it in us that is the good friend that brings out the best in our friends? Or are we the friend people go to to gossip? Right? Like, is that something that you really want? <laughs> you know? I'm the place people can come to really be quite angry and self-righteous and increase their entitlement and general rage. Well done, life, right? <laughs> or are you the person that brings out the best in your friends and makes them think more deeply about connection and benefit? You know? So the more you work on yourself, the more naturally your impact on others is better, and the more naturally you bring out the best in them. Because you're living by example, right? We can't preach to each other. It doesn't work, right? Have you ever tried? Has your mother ever tried <laughs> to you, <laughs> right? Your life would be so much easier if you just, and you're like, yeah, that's great, thank you. And then like 20 years later, you're like, oh my God, she was right, that's so embarrassing. I'm not telling though, <laughs> I'm not telling her, <laughs> right? But you know, the thing is, is that we don't hear unsolicited advice. We don't hear advice that we haven't asked for or are open to in some way, but we do learn from each other's example. And so what is the example you want to be? This is the question, yeah. <clears throat> and so this last pair in these eight worldly concerns is reputation. And reputation is a fascinating thing, especially now that social media is so much more pervasive than it was even a few years ago, where all, a lot of our mental energy goes into how do I appear? How do I appear to others? And, you know, even, um, you know, what's my social profile? What's my online profile? And really being very aware of that. Yeah, and some of that is maybe professionally savvy, maybe some of that is useful in some context, but a lot of that causes suffering, doesn't it? Did people like that post? Did they like it? Did they understand it? All right, all right. There's a lot of thought about that. There's, never mind social media, there's just a lot of like workplace politics and family dynamics about, you know, the good ones and the bad ones, or the ones that are good workers and the ones that are bad workers and what that all means and who, how do they see me? And um, maybe I won't leave work early because that'll look bad, or maybe I'll stay late because that'll look good, right? There, there's, a, there's a fair amount of this in our head, depending on different contexts, right? But, you know, we all have our version of reputation worry, which again creates inner chaos. And so the way again to unpack that is to see the lie that says good reputation makes me happy, bad reputation makes me sad. Good reputation can be a condition for happiness and it can be a condition for suffering. How is it a condition for suffering if you have a really good reputation? Yeah. You have to defend it? Yes, you have to defend it. There's a lot of effort in defending it. Yeah. What else can happen if you have a really good reputation? You can lose it. Yeah, you can lose it. And then who are you? Yeah. Um, what about people wanting something from you? Yeah? People kind of being associated with you, not because of you, but because how they like being seen their reputation issues, glomming onto your reputation issues, and then it's just a whole mishmash, right? And is anyone friends with anyone really, or is it just, it looks good to be with you, selfie, right? Yeah, I really like her hair, let's hang out, right? 
I mean, it's interesting, right? We're not that superficial all the time, but sometimes we are and have a real anxiety when we like lose face, right? When people think that we're not intelligent or not attractive or not wealthy or not whatever our thing is about reputation, a lot of worry can go into that. And so we want to remind ourselves that good reputation is not the cause of happiness. Otherwise, all Hollywood movie stars would be overflowing with joy. Are they? Right? They got their like five year window, right? They've got their peak. And even in that peak, there's probably a lot of anxiety about maintenance, right? If reputation was the source of happiness, all of those people would be happy. Why is there so much drug abuse and alcoholism and infidelity with famous people, right? If, if reputation was the cause of happiness, they should be doing fine. Right? They should have happy marriages, they should be really relaxed, they should need no substances, natural high. The very fact that there is so much substance abuse and infidelity is a symptom that the strategy they thought for happiness was a flawed strategy. They got famous. It worked! And they're still not happy. Crap! Now what? Right? Imagine if you got everything you wanted and still weren't happy. What would that mean? it would mean those things were not the causes for happiness, right? And so what we're trying to unpack is that we're being sold a bill of goods, we're being lied to constantly about the sources of happiness, and yet we still strive and strive to be seen a certain way and have so much fear about being seen otherwise. And it's not like that's without practicality, right? There is a practical aspect in being seen in a professional light in your career so that you can be of more benefit. Sure, there is something good about not having a terrible reputation so that you can be of benefit. Sure, generally speaking, but that's not what I'm talking about. It's the hunger, right? That's the hunger of attachment that needs more status, more recognition, seen more and more different, right? And that is so afraid to lose face. So if you had a terrible reputation, is there anything good about that? Terrible reputation, everyone hates you, thinks you're terrible. Is there anything good about it? it can't get worse. Can't get worse, absolutely. <laughs> relief, right? Relief, immediate relief. <laughs> you're can't go. more free in your, in your actions. Exactly, you're so much more free in your actions, right? Have you ever seen like a really happy homeless person with like a mental illness, but they're like fine, and they're just totally smiley? And you're like, yeah, right. Shopping cart, raincoat, good. All right. You know, it's, it's interesting, right? But like some of them are perfectly happy. Lots of reasons there, sure, sure. But you know, it's interesting to look at like, what if no one liked you? The pressure would really be off in terms of relationship maintenance, right? You could have so much time, right? <laughs> right? I mean, really, you could just binge Netflix, whatever, right? No one would bug you, no one would hassle you, right? But I mean, this is the thing is that we assume a good reputation is good, but it's not. We assume bad reputation is bad, but it's not always, right? It's the mind we're bringing to it. Um, if you had a terrible reputation, say there was some big scandal or something, the people that stick with you, doesn't that say something about their care for you? That they'll still hang out with you even when you look bad. That says something about the strength of your relationship. And the people that drift off if you lose your reputation, that says something too, right? It's interesting information, right? Rebuilding oneself from scratch is not necessarily a bad thing. It could be quite interesting and freeing. You'd spend all of this momentum and energy in your life trying to be this certain person and then it all comes crumbling down. Oh, you could be someone new. Maybe that person made sense when you're 18. Does it make sense when you're 35? You know, reevaluate. Right? A loss of reputation is not the end of the world. Having a good reputation is not the source of all happiness. Part of you already knew this, yes? This is not brain surgery. And yet, how do we live? Yeah? So having inner peace and outer chaos is very much about letting go of these eight worldly concerns by catching them when you fall into the trap. And sometimes that is all it takes. You see yourself falling into the trap and you almost embarrass it to dissolve. Yeah, you go, oh, there I go again. And you laugh it apart. There I go again, needing that. There I go again, fearing that. <sighs> Noticing it sometimes is enough for it to dissolve. 
Yeah, just catching yourself. And there's a lot of ways to build the skill of catching yourself, of noticing what you say to yourself as you say it, with the space to choose whether or not to believe it. We all have moments where we're able to check whether or not to believe what we say to ourselves, but we can build that skill more consistently and deeply. Yes? I don't know if this is a question, but sometimes when I notice this stuff, I kind of, my mind is, wow, yeah, great job. And then, <laughs> then it gets even worse. It's like the, the tension or the mm. food gets even stronger because I kind of relax, like, oh, I'm doing well. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I'm doing well with my self awareness. And then, like, <laughs> yeah, it yeah. It's really like, and it's like a really bodily sensation. And then I have, so it doesn't dissolve. Sometimes it doesn't dissolve, this is true. Sometimes it gets worse, yeah, by noticing. Because what's happening is your attachment is a stronger habit than your clarity. And so your attachment says, oh, no, you don't. I'll show you that cake is happiness. Remember that one cake? That was happiness. Yes, you want it. Right? And you're like, no, no, no. It was just a condition. It was just a condition. And then it's like, no, I am the happiness. Right? And it just pulls you in. Right? And sometimes you have to let it play out. Right? Sometimes the attachment is too strong that you've been sucked in and the pattern has started again. And what you do in that case is to ride it out with the lights on, right? To ride out the pattern while watching this time. This time, let me watch myself as I play it out. Say, for example, you get home at the end of the day, you're tired, you're going to watch one episode on Netflix of your favorite series. Just one. Then you're going to go to bed early, have a good night, fresh in the morning, right? That's your plan. And then you watch one, and then it's like, next episode, five, four, three, two, and you're like, oh, two is fine, two is fine. And then like five or ten episodes later, are you five or ten percent happier? Yeah? But sometimes you have to let yourself do it and watch it this time to see that it's true. You already knew you were telling yourself a lie. You already know what happens when you fall down that vortex, right? You already know. But Try again while your eyes are open. You go, okay, I'm going to watch another episode. And then at the end of that, am I happier? No, but I'm going to do another one anyway. Click, watch it. <laughs> through. My eyes really hurt, and I'm going to be tired for work tomorrow. Anyway, next one. And just watch yourself do the thing you've been doing anyway, but don't let yourself lie during the whole time. So it's like you're, you're giving yourself permission to do the same old habit. Oh, I'm going to do that relationship again. I'm going to do that weird workplace thing again. I'm going to do this whole scenario that I've done a million times. I'm sucked in. The attachment was too strong. But this time, do it with your eyes open. And just kind of watch it unfold. And sometimes you see how much you hurt yourself with these patterns that then the next time it's about to start, you're almost sick to your stomach and you don't, yeah? Sometimes we can have this experience if we've um, had an addiction that we've moved through and had that kind of rock bottom moment and sometimes you need the rock bottom moment in order to really find the sobriety but that doesn't mean that there's not still temptation. So you avoid the bar or the pub, right? Because you know being in that environment triggers that attachment. But it's not the fault of the bar or the pub that you have that attachment. And yet you're aware of conditions. So you've moved through your attachment to the point where it's not a daily problem, but you know yourself well enough that the temptation will always be there. So also managing conditions a little bit, having that honesty with yourself that knows conditions without blaming conditions. That I'm when, when I'm with this sort of person, my ego wants to prove something, and it wants to show off, and it wants to be validated. And you know, this kind of cool, shiny person, when I get around them, I behave badly, and my attachment gets engaged. And if they don't like me, I feel terrible. All right, that's important knowledge. So the next time you come across a person like that, you're not blaming them for being a condition, but you know they're a condition. And already there's a tiny bit of space there less likely to be hooked again. But it could be that you need to not go to those kind of parties where you meet those kind of people. You know, save time. Yeah. And so there's a concept in Buddhism of retreating, right? 
doing a retreat, doing a really intensive meditation away from the world. And the point of doing these retreats is not to be forever gone. It's to withdraw yourself from the conditions that trigger bad habits and build your strength so that then you come back into those conditions and they no longer overpower you. So it's not a forever strategy, a retreat. You retreat in order to come back. And we can do a mini retreat every single day, just five, 10 minutes, where we consciously separate ourselves from the conditions that trigger agitation and build your strength of clarity so that when you go back into the world, you're less quickly triggered. So of course, the easiest technique is just a good old meditation. Yeah, and so I thought maybe we'd do a shorty, just a shorty, are you up for it? Yeah? <laughs> okay, so five minutes only. We'll just see what happens in five minutes. And this meditation is a clarity of mind meditation. And so this one is what your main job is. <clears throat> the main job with this meditation is that whatever you say to yourself in your head, whatever you feel, decide not to agree or disagree. Yeah, whatever occurs to you, decide not to agree or disagree. Just let it arise and dissolve naturally like clouds passing by. And so if it's a cool thought that's really interesting and intriguing, you choose not to embellish it and follow it and go, ooh, that's a cool thought, let's make it bigger. And if it's a terrible thought, you don't go, ooh, don't think that, don't think that. No, you just, whatever arises, let it arise and dissolve naturally and just see what happens. Yeah, and where you're focusing your mind is on kind of the spacious clarity that's always present. So you can imagine this is the vast blue sky, spacious and radiant, and that all the thoughts and emotions are like clouds. So all sorts of weather coming and going, but that moves and that doesn't matter. Just keep connecting with the clarity of the mind. So we're just gonna experiment, see what happens. Just five minutes of that and you will totally get distracted and that's so normal. And every time you get distracted, you just come on back and go, anyway, <laughs> right? No big deal, anyway, even if you have to do it every five seconds, okay? <laughs> All right, so straight back. There's a part of the mind that is moving and a part of the mind that is still. Allow that part that is moving to move, but keep your intention and your attention on the part that is still. That spacious clarity.
Okay, you can relax your attention. <clears throat> so, whether you feel successful or not, just check in with how do you feel now compared to before you did the meditation. Yeah, just kind of think. More clear? More calm? Anybody worse? Possible. <laughs> possible. If you've had a really bad day, it's possible. Yeah. No? What can, yeah? I was surprised it felt longer than I thought. Yeah. Yeah, but did anyone go, oh my gosh, that was five minutes? That sound, seemed like nothing. And everyone else is like, that was the longest five minutes of my whole life. <laughs> yeah, I promise I set a timer. Exactly yeah, five minutes. Yeah. But yeah, the way um, time feels. So if you say, I have no time to meditate, you probably have five minutes somewhere in the day. Yeah? Yeah. Can I ask about a meditation? Like, uh, uh, there was this meditation of Deepak Chopra and Oprah. <laughs> they were like doing this. And he was saying that, yeah, like meditation is about, you know, like you are having these uh, moments of like these gaps, mm. but you don't even know about them because there are gaps. So, but I mean, I, I don't really feel, I mean, I feel resistance to, towards that uh, idea. Yeah. So what's your idea about that? Um, that's a very male presentation, right? Um, uh, <laughs> I remember saying, um, hearing, which is fine, men are fine. Um, but I remember talking to my dad once about meditation and about how, um, you know, there's no moment of mind really without thought. And he was like, I think there is. <laughs> I was like, really? And he's like, yeah, sometimes I'm not thinking anything. And I'm like, really? And we had this whole moment, right? And he's like, yeah. Whole parts of the day, no particular thought. <laughs> and he's a smart guy, right? I was so surprised. But um, I think that that some people, and it's not a gender thing, I think some people have a, a naturally more active mind with a lot of words and a lot of feelings and a lot of busyness. And some people have a more um, quiet mind. And it's not good or bad either way in and of itself, but it sounds like you maybe have a more busy mind. And so when he's talking about looking for the gaps, but you can't even notice them because they're gaps and all of this sort of gap business, it's kind of like don't even worry about that as part of the agenda. Um, space between thoughts will either show itself or it won't. Is neither particularly good or bad at this level. It's the process of being able to be objective about your experience. This is the skill that we need in our daily life so badly, is to be able to have a thought without assuming it's true. We think all sorts of nonsense, right? Some of it's quite brilliant, right? Who knew? But some of it is just rubbish, right? You know, song fragments, half-remembered memories, random associations, disturbing fantasies. Who knows what's going on in there? It doesn't have to mean anything. Right? It's just the coming together of experiences into a reaction, maybe useful, maybe not. So this skill of being able to have a thought without committing to it, knowing that there is consciousness there without this wholehearted belief in the content, that being able to see your thoughts and emotions much more like weather and connecting more with the spacious clarity that is also present this is what's useful. And that spacious clarity that's always present, it's not like you will always notice it or feel it. It's more like an awareness of it existing above the clouds, right? As if you were like in an airplane and went all the way up, right? When you're in the airplane above the clouds, it seems so obvious there's all this clarity and space looking down on the clouds. But when you're on Earth and it's storming, that's all there is, right? That's the, that is the sky. We even forget the blueness is there. Right? And so just getting this habit of, I can have a thought which might not be true. I can have a thought which might be true. How about I just have some thoughts and don't poke at them? Yeah. In a way, what it helps you do is digest everything that has come before. It's why we're so tired, right? We don't give ourselves time to digest and process our life. And it's why a lot of the great meditators don't need to sleep or need to sleep less. They don't have to recover from anything because they're processing things as they arise. Yeah? So it's just a very gentle skill of being able to let things arise and dissolve, arise and dissolve. 
so that when you're in your daily life, you don't keep doing that. You let things arise and check, arise and check. So it, a thought arises and you go, useful or not, true or not true, keep or lose. Then you have choice, right? So much of our day we have kind of autopilot or no choice about our thought or our mood because we're just in it. You know what I mean? And so if you can just take short periods in your day to give yourself back the choice to choose, which thoughts do I want to keep? And what happens is then the agitated thoughts slow down and quiet. You might still have lots of words and emotions and ideas, but they're not so jangly if you give yourself enough time. And then as things start to settle, you can consciously introduce a thought into that space and it will take hold like compassion, like love, like wisdom, like equanimity. You can plant a thought and it can really take over your whole mind like a beautiful sunset. Yeah, it can just take it over and imbue it. And then you can be living your normal everyday life imbued with loving kindness, with compassion, because there was space for it to take root. If you're trying to kind of plant some love in this jangly field, it'll kind of spit it out again and say, yes, may everyone be well. But anyway, phew, Right? There's no room for it to land. So if you can kind of let things settle first, then you can be kind of proactive of what do I want in there? Because we're not aiming for just a blank neutral space. We're trying to come back to clarity so that then we can add what we want, not just the stuff that happens out of habit. Does that make sense? Yeah. Ah, um, so how else did it go? Did anyone have anything you wanted to ask or share? Yeah. Yeah, um, maybe you've already answered this in a way, but I have been meditating daily for about a year, mm -hmm. maybe. And um, in the beginning it, it went well and I had these amazing experiences. <laughs> and now I'm beginning to notice that I want to achieve a particular experience. Yes. So I'm looking for that yes. when I sit. Mm. So it's becoming a problem. Yes. <laughs> about hope and fear. Yes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> how, can, how can I deal with that? Because yes. I'm criticizing myself while I'm sitting. Yes, yes. And, and then, but still wanting it. Yeah, you're like, but that was really cool that one time. But no, 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 don't want it. Don't. But it was really cool. No, 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 don't want it. Right, like that, yeah. yeah. It's a classic tale. It's a classic tale, yeah. Um, um, and there's a lot of approaches. One, one thing is that it's, it's probably, from a Buddhist perspective, it's a sign that you've done some practice in the past, which is good news, but the bad news is that you didn't do it enough to have control over it, <laughs> right? So it's good news and bad news. Yeah. And so what you want to say is, all right, stepping back from meditation altogether, why do I want to meditate? What was my goal? If it was just one more form of entertainment, there are other things I can do. You could take ecstasy, have a great experience. I don't recommend it. That is the disclaimer. No one sue me. Um, but you know, like, are you meditating for entertainment value? That is a good question. And sometimes we are. Sometimes we're just curious. There's a million reasons to meditate. We want to be a bit more relaxed, a bit stress-free, a bit nicer to our kids. You know, there's a million reasons. But I think there is some great impact in deciding that Whatever inner peace I achieve, may it ripple outward as outer peace. May whatever clarity I touch have an impact in triggering clarity in others. This is not for me. I don't do this just for me. I do this for the whole world, and then I wind up having a benefit. So you start with, this is for all sentient beings of which I am one, and then it becomes less important for something to happen. Because you know what is happening is, one less agitated person in the world this second. Yeah, and that that is actually a huge help. And it stands in direct opposition to someone else in the world who is actively agitating their mind and thinking about hatred and thinking about divisiveness and wanting to harm others. There are a lot of people out there consciously training their mind to hate. Right? They wouldn't think of it that way. But you know, through propaganda or conditioning or whatever fundamentalist values are being conditioned to agitate. And so it's like they're training themselves in harm. And so any moment we are training ourselves in non-harm, in peace, it's standing in opposition to that, right? And that's a huge benefit. And so you think, all I could do was watch my breath badly for about 10 minutes. 
that is still something, actually. Because those, uh, those 10 minutes, I could have spent searching for happiness on my phone, scrolling for happiness. Happiness? Link. No, nope, that wasn't happiness. Keep scrolling, keep scrolling. Happiness? No, nope. all right, keep scrolling, keep, right? Which is actually adding a lot of agitation out there, right? Um, you know, you can do it with the woods. It's not just the fault of millennials, right? Looking for happiness in this forest, looking for happiness in that forest, looking for happiness in this friendship, looking for happiness in that book. You know, we, we can be in this really hungry mind and increase the agitation in the world. Or we can consciously come back to some peace and then spread some peace. So the, the first thing to do is to ask yourself, why am I doing this? And is it for reasons I want to keep going on with? Yeah, the, the other way is to say, this is actually excellent training if I know what can happen if I start to train my mind. Yeah, it's like, okay, if I really train my mind, what if that beautiful experience happened again, but this time was under my control, and I could even expand it into infinite compassion, or a really deep wisdom, and that my love and compassion could have this really beautiful energetic quality to it as well. That's, that's what could happen someday, some life. That's a nice kind of thing to think about, but it might happen today, it might happen in 10 lifetimes. These things aren't knowable. And sometimes they are just a chakra burp, right? Right? You know, you're messing with your chakras, all sorts of stuff happens, right? You know, right? Like, don't play with them, you'll go blind, all right? Uh, you know, it's, it's really interesting when you start even doing breathing meditation, your subtle energy system does start to settle down and align, and some really blissful things can happen. And you're like, well, never mind working for compassion, that was fun, let's do it again. You know, forgetting that your point was working on compassion, right? And you want to start fiddling with your energy system. And and it actually can be a little bit dangerous, especially without a good teacher, because you can have these really beautiful experiences, but they're not in your control, and get yourself kind of tangled, right? And some people who try and do very advanced meditation too quickly without a solid foundation of stability and knowing why um, can actually trigger some mental illness. Yeah, it, it's happened. I've seen things, <laughs> right? And um, you know, it can even trigger a psychosis if you're prone to it. So if you have a history of mental health issues or worry that you could trigger some because of your family history, just go very gently, very experimental, and make sure you get a good teacher that can kind of help you with obstacles. Yeah. So um, it's tricky when you've had these beautiful experiences, and, and a lot of people have, because it's, it's just this temptation always. But if you can treat it just the same as if you'd had a terrible meditation where all sorts of old trauma unfolded and all these memories exploded, and you're like, oh my god, who knew that was in there? I'm not meditating. You know, if you can treat them both with equanimity of, these are the kinds of weather that arise in my mind. And both of them are impermanent. Both of them change moment to moment. And so clinging or aversion isn't practical because none of them stay the same. This beautiful experience moves on. This horrible experience moves on. This is just what happens with the nature of the mind. And so that's a good knowledge to have. So just gently, gently. It's, it's tricky. I, I feel for you, definitely. But um, just, yeah, keep plugging around. Yeah, keep plugging at it and see. You know, keep it as an experiment without a goal. Yeah, just an experiment that has the motivation of, may it be a benefit, but what that benefit is, I don't know. May it bring some peace, but how much, we'll see. Yeah, and um, also to realize we don't have 100% control over everything, like we have some control over our mind, but so many small things can affect our meditation, like the conversation we had right before we started to meditate, or what we looked at online right before we meditated, or if the pressure system in the weather just dropped, suddenly we're sleepy, or if we ate or haven't eaten at the right time. You know, so if you can kind of also bring patience to your practice, your approach to meditation is as important as your meditation. Does that make sense, the way you approach it? Because sometimes we approach it the way we approach school, like needing to accomplish something or be graded or be good at. And it's not really like that. It's a process. So how do you, what do you do 
with yourself when you're bored? What do you do with yourself when you're impatient? What do you do with yourself when you're inspired? And if what you do each time is just don't give up, that is a really amazing discipline that's going to help you in every part of your life. And every single kind of meditation will help you with focus and clarity if you do it right. right? And what is the right way to meditate? It is if you get distracted, you come back to whatever you're meditating on. A bad meditation is if you get distracted and go, oh, well, that's fun, and go with it. right? So the problem is not getting distracted. The problem is what you do with the distraction. And it is very normal to get distracted, be intrigued by that distraction, and then just go with it is totally normal. But if you can say to yourself, if it's important, I'll come back to it. But right now, I'm meditating. Come back to your focal object, whatever that is. Yeah, so a good meditation is when you come back. A bad meditation is when you let yourself go into that distraction. And you just reinforce the habit of loose associating. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Does that help? Do you want to ask a follow-up question? Yeah. That would be very helpful. Yeah. 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 Any anybody else? Yeah. I'm just wondering. I do a lot of meditation through YouTube, and what you just said kind of stuck with me. Would you not recommend trying different sorts of meditations, like shaka meditations, and all those sort of things? The yeah. It's, it is interesting with, with YouTube because some very advanced meditations are uploaded. Yeah. And I guess if you know that the important things to check for are lineage. So whatever the meditation is online, to know where it came from, like what was the source? Like is this Hindu or is it Buddhist? If it's Hindu or Buddhist, what type of Buddhism or Hinduism? What is the series of teachers? Or is it just some new agey person cherry picking bits that are fun for them and smashing them together and making something of their own? Which may be well intended, which may help with stress release, but also could get you in a real tangle. Yeah, so check like what is the source. So if you see a video that's really intriguing, find their website and you know ask questions and where does this come from and what is its purpose. So where did it come from and what is its purpose is really important. Um, if you can contact the teacher of that video through email at least um, or someone of their same lineage and tradition, just in case something goes wrong. Right? So what will I do if something goes wrong? If I start really spinning or get really a strange sensation or I trigger a panic attack, is there someone of this tradition that I can get in contact with and sort out my obstacles? Mm -hmm. So it's not like you can't use these things online, but to just be a little bit anchored somehow, mm -hmm. have an anchor of a person, a real person you can talk to in some way, even if it's online, um, related to that lineage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, like this. And you know, and, and it is helpful to just, you know, we probably all experimented with a lot of things at some point, and then maybe eventually it's good to settle on something. Because um, otherwise it's a little bit like being at the base camp of Mount Everest and looking at all the trailheads, but never going up the mountain. And they probably all get you there, right? But you have to pick one. Yeah, and knowledge of the other ones might make you a better mountaineer, but at some point, one. Yeah, and you could chip out your own path all by yourself, right? But you could also fall into an ice chasm, right? <laughs> so my, why reinvent, right? Why reinvent? Yeah, so a teacher is important. And, um, you know, keeping your, like, healthy cynicism, you know, your healthy skepticism, that, like, if there's alarm bells, like, this person seems a little bit, ah, oh, I don't know, like, ask more questions of that, because sometimes we do get kind of a... I'm worried about this one. I like what he's saying, but uh, because sometimes um, a very bad teacher can have very good education. And so what they say is really interesting, intriguing, beautiful stuff, but actually they are a bit dodgy, right? And it's tricky because you're like, but what they're saying is so amazing. And it's like, yeah, well, they stole it from somewhere else and they're charismatic, <laughs> right? So um, I think the most useful YouTubes that I use myself are ones of my own teachers to remind me of what I've already heard. And occasionally, you know, something to like cross-fertilize or like give me some new ideas or something, but to know what is the lineage, what is the purpose. Yeah, if that helps. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, anybody else about the topics of tonight or anything else randomly? 
I'll do my best. Or debates. Does it make sense or are there parts that are sort of troubling you? Yeah, so if we go back and think, all right, so attachment to pleasure and fear of pain agitates my mind. Attachment to acquisition or gain and fear of loss agitates my mind. Um, avoiding criticism and seeking praise agitates my mind. And hoping for a good reputation and fearing a bad reputation agitates my mind. And what's more, when that mind is agitated, not only do I lose inner peace, but I also probably have an impact on the outer peace. Can you see a relationship between the way all of us seek pleasure and avoid pain in how the world is not as healthy as we'd like it to be? Because we want to be comfortable and we don't want to be uncomfortable, do we ever use resources in a way that don't help? Yeah. I have a I think I have a question, but yeah. I can't really formulate it because it's like, I think it's, I, it's falling into traps while I try to formulate it in, in my head. And it's about kind of like, oh, I try to, try to make a, like a general, really black and white question, so uh, it will. It's like, maybe starting with the kid with the ponies and the, the, per, the, the, the new kid wasn't like, just stole the pony and ran away, mm. and then throughout, like teenage, and you don't have so much friends, and kind of it kind of have like <coughs> that the outer conditions mm. are so s strong. Let's yeah, say, absolutely. That the mind gets like kind of isolated and yeah. can have a lot of trust issues <coughs> absolutely. I guess, with the outer world, and then like yeah, one part. Oh, I have a little part of me like this, like oh, but this. Like about responsibility, yeah. like how much responsibility can we really put on each person, and like, yeah. like how to create also like a, love, a community where you can actually start to trust and blah blah blah. But this, so I guess it's about like the responsibility for yourself, or some kind of this kind of thing that it doesn't fall into some kind of like. But you already talked about it a bit like self-optimizing your yeah. your your own boss and blah, like this kind. Yeah, of don't make it too superficial. Yeah, yeah. it's. It, so I have some. Yeah. Uh, I have some like when the outer and also about like yeah. I don't know homophobia, racism, yeah. and like being exposed to a lot of. Yeah, it, it has an effect, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. I, I, I was just. Want yeah. To hear your reflection about that. Okay. Yeah, you no, know, it's it's really <laughs> important because external things do have an effect. Absolutely, they have an effect. It's kind of like now we're pushing pause on the VCR. Do we still use VCRs? No. <laughs> <laughs> we're pushing pause on something. Yes. <laughs> and and saying, okay, so everything that came before has conditioned my worldview and the way I respond to people and what I think I need for happiness. And it all makes sense given the context of my life. Now with the pause button pushed, can I step away from it and say, and now what? What do I want to keep? Where, what does my wisdom tell me about moving forward? And it is tricky because it's not like, ooh, um, it's not like, we will ever be completely rid of our past conditioning while we're still an ordinary person. Maybe if we become a holy being of some kind, we will. But while we're regular people, our conditioning has an effect. You know, for example, I am very aware of being a woman when I'm in India. And, you know, and I had lots of uh, thoughts about being a strong, empowered, independent woman in India. I will walk around alone, damn it, right? And I did, and I was attacked by two teenage boys who wanted to rape me, right? They did. It was very obvious. And if I hadn't been so big and tall, and they hadn't been skinny Indian boys, terrible things would have happened. But, you know, I remembered my Aikido skills, and I pushed them in the ditch, right? as a nun, right? It was a bad look, but it was for the greater good, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> right, you know, right? So, like, I was very aware of the conditioning of having been brought up a woman and, and what we all experience as women in terms of fear, and then also the conditioning of having been brought up by a, you know, a feminist sort of mother who wanted me to be strong and empowered, and all of that coming together in a whole package of assumptions, and then having the rug ripped out, right? And then what do I do with that? Can I say, um, 
it is not those boys' fault that I felt so scared afterwards and needed to go back to the nunnery and have a big hug with all of my friends. No, I needed to have a hug and I needed all my nuns to go, oh, that was scary, oh, we have to be careful, oh, let's take measures, let's do something. Um, that needed to happen, but it didn't need to happen from its own side. The things I needed to comfort myself afterwards and the reasons why I was agitated in the first place were the result of external conditions. But those same external conditions could have triggered someone else differently. Right? Someone with a different set of life skills and a different set of life experience could have behaved better or worse than I did, could have been more or less agitated than I was. Do you reckon? Right? If they'd have a different life, but the same thing had happened, their response might have been different. They might have also been scared, but more scared or less scared. They might have also been annoyed with boys who are socialized that way. They might have also wanted a cuddle from their nun friends, but in a different way. Right? So the conditions have an impact, but to have the space that says, I recognize my own response, and I look after myself in a way that's wise in terms of the world, but at the same time hold the fact that not everyone would have the same exact response. Therefore, they did not give me this feeling on their own, 100%. I had some projection involved. Does it make sense? Right, and so then, then what I do with that information is how do I make sure that an incident like that doesn't color me in a way that's prejudicial. So that now every time I see a young Indian boy who's skinny and has that smile on his face, I don't immediately get scared or annoyed, right? Not wanting to run or wanting to fight. Because that's what happens with prejudice and that's what happens with projection, is that one thing happens, you have a response, and then you assume anything that bears resemblance to that will also be true in the same way, which then often makes it true in the same way, doesn't it? So if you're expecting people to hate you, sometimes they do, if they are the sort of person that hatred comes out of because of their habits. Right? But if you're expecting people to love and accept you, if love and acceptance is possible in them, you sometimes bring it out. And it's not so black and white as that, right? There's so many conditions, so many conditions. But what we're trying to do is take the power back from our history and take the power back from our childhood and take the power back from all of the conditions of this world that say you need this for comfort and can't have that or you'll be uncomfortable and check. Which is why we do this very simple meditation of thoughts arise, you neither agree or disagree. Thoughts arise, you, never fall, you don't follow or suppress. You just let them arise and dissolve because it means now that we're an adult, now that some of the chaos has settled a little bit because we have enough space to come to a class like this that shows you have enough space for reflection, now that we're here, what do we do with this information? Now that we're here, how do we move forward so that less agitates us? And if something is agitating us and it is harmful in a relative sense to other people, we can still be assertive and say something and do something while holding the fact that not from its own side did it give us this feeling. Two things can be true at once. Yeah, and it's just, it's difficult because you can get yourself into a tangle very easily. But Buddhism should never counteract common sense. It should make your common sense even more sharp and even more expansive. So if, if you feel like the thing to do is to address a wrong in an assertive way, because that's what your life wisdom is telling you, then you hold that. But then you bring something like Buddhism or philosophy to it and say, doing something about it should come from the clearest, calmest place, because then it's gonna be as effective as it possibly can be. So how do I get myself less agitated so that moving forward I don't cause harm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 So you just, you just kind of work back and forth between the relative truths and the ultimate truths. Yeah. Uh, I actually have three questions related to social media, uh, which at least for me, but also I've seen statistics, is a new source of uh, really mental disturbances. Uh, so the first question is, do you use 
yourself? Were you active on social media? Yeah. Yeah. You are? Yeah. Okay. Yep. <laughs> I am. <laughs> what would you say to a person that just makes the choice of saying, I'm going to avoid this, where there seems to be some kind of assumption mm. if you're not like, you know, wanting to meditate your whole life in the mountains, you want to be a part of it. Yeah. It's also some kind of acceptance that this is this is a part. So if a person says, okay, I make a conscious choice to just avoid, mm. uh, that's my second question. Yeah. You are you feeling are you feeling judged by the by people that avoid social media? No, if a person use avoidance as mm. a strategy of uh. taking away the source of social uh, of like mental disturbance. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what would your uh, reflection uh, be on that strategy? And the third question is, mm. if for example, young people there is a huge mental illness that that is really strongly correlated with the social media phenomenon, if they are somehow addicted or such, yeah. what would be your uh, best advice how to res how to respond yeah. to likes or you know yeah. twist the storms or whatever. Yeah. So those two questions we could get those? I think so. I I'll I'll have a go and then um, ask the a follow up yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, and this is my this is my first smartphone and it is very exciting. It's so exciting. There's so many things. Uh, six months. Six okay. months. Um, I did have, you know, email before that, right? And um, and people, you know, the main reason was uh, connection and communication because um, a lot of people are interested in Buddhism, but there's not a lot of English-speaking people who are educated um, in a way that's useful um, to kind of sort things out. And so um, I was teaching at a tiny little center in the Blue Mountains outside Australia um, and realized that there was a lot more need in the world than I was able to cover. And and so a friend said, hey, why don't I put this on YouTube, right? And I was like, all right, <laughs> whatever. And it's, you know, it's not a substitute for a, a human connection, but it helps, in, it helps, I guess, reinforce a human connection that's already been made. Yeah? It can reinforce a human connection that's already been made. Um, I, I realized that with social media, my family feels a lot more connected to me. Because, I, you know, I don't live in my hometown. I haven't lived in my hometown for 17 years or something, you know. And so my, my family misses me, and, they, and I have an odd lifestyle, you might imagine. And so they're wondering, what on earth is she up to, right? And for years they were wondering, you know, a decade. They were like, what is she doing? I don't know. Anyway, seems to be, you know, doing well. <laughs> I don't know, you know, and just sort of occasionally saying, now I'm in Sweden, post. They're like, oh, she's in Sweden. Ah, cool. Hey, you know, you have relatives from Sweden. Makes them happy, right? So, so there's a skillful use, but I also do notice, like, if I'm in an airport and um, feeling a little ungrounded, feeling a little distracted, and I sort of look to it as a, like a, blanket, like a safety blanket, like, oh, everybody's looking at me because I'm dressed strange. I'd rather not feel their gaze. I'll just look at this. Mm -hmm. ah, da, da. Sure, there's something to read in here, do, 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 you know. And forgetting that, yes, I am a tall, bald woman who wears red. That is interesting. People will stare. But everyone stares at everyone, right? It's not just me, right? Like, you know, <laughs> and that actually, if I put the phone down and just kind of look around, I might see cool stuff and make a friend, and usually do. Almost as soon as I put this phone down in an airport, someone will come and sit next to me and talk about philosophy, and it's awesome, right? Sometimes I'm jet lagged and I'm like, uh, yes, okay, yes, right, <laughs> hit me, <laughs> right? But, you know, that's the thing is that I, I have to be mindful about why. Why? Why am I using it now? Because sometimes it's a good reason, sometimes it's a bad reason. And probably you couldn't tell from looking whether it's a good reason or a bad reason. Only the person using it knows. And usually they don't know because they're not looking at their mind. But it's just it, a habit, right? Isn't it so that uh, finding equanimity has always been a universal challenge and it is even more challenging now because of this? I mean, it's yeah. just an assumption I make. 
Yeah, but you know, I think before social media was a thing, before we had email, I mean, I remember being at loose ends as a kid and picking up a book, flipping through it, putting it back, picking up another book, flipping through it, looking at, you know, it was like the physical equivalent of scrolling, right? Maybe I'll do the dishes, maybe I'll do this thing here, maybe I'll do a home maintenance project, you know, it was sort of a version of scrolling. The problem is with these phones is that there's more possibility to find something interesting. <laughs> and whether you find something interesting or not, the possibility exists, right? So you'll just keep checking until you find something interesting. Even if you never find something interesting, the hope is there, which just, you know, awakens your attachment. And so I think it's very useful to discipline yourself about your social media and your phone, you know, to set a, like, you know, set a, it turns off at seven, you know, it doesn't turn on until seven sort of thing. You know, there are, there are apps for that, right? <laughs> right, but you know, that's the thing of just making it a bit more intentional so that you don't fall into an attachment vortex. Give yourself some supports not to fall into it. And with the kids and their depression and it being reinforced with the social media, so much of that is just the human condition of narcissism makes us sad. Right? Seeking validation makes us sad because it will never be enough. And so when they're looking for likes, they're looking for validation. When they're posting selfies, they're looking for validation. And because it's coming from attachment, it will never be enough. And so they're sad. Right? And so if you're a parent, to talk about that. Right? And to say, it is perfectly acceptable to say, here's a cool thing I want to share with my friends. Here's a cool idea I want to share with my friends. But if I'm becoming compulsive about looking for validation, it will never be enough. It will never be enough. You will never have enough followers on Instagram. You will never have enough thumbs ups on your Facebook or whatever, right? It will never be enough because you're coming from attachment. Yeah? So if it's you're kind of like almost enough, you'll have a moment of, oh, that was nice, lots of people like that. And if it was your idea of not quite enough, you'll be like, oh, people didn't really like that. I'm bad. And our hopes and fears go up and down with you know these kind of ratings that we have on the phone. But it's not like they wouldn't exist without the phone. It's just that it's more extreme, maybe. 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 But uh, you know, I think the, the concept of Attachment and aversion agitate the mind is a universal concept. Whatever format it takes is the individual, right? And so, you know, if there's a particular format that's particularly problematic, it's good to address that, right? Like, apparently heroin feels great. That doesn't mean we should take it. Right? But it triggers that pleasure love, right? And lots of people have opioid addictions because of wanting some symptoms relief, and then it turns into enjoyment of that feeling, which turns into something that they have trouble breaking, and it's incredibly poignant, right? But it's coming from the same place of this isn't enough. But what about my, uh, uh, my second question of removing the cause yeah. of suffering in this case? I mean, uh, there is a big assumption. Uh, of you have to. It's like, yeah. you can't, I mean, it's like almost being accused of not having an email. Yeah. Phone. But what if a person, is it like saying that, well, you're not accepting reality as it oh, is, you're I not see, relating yeah. as a human being, as a social being? Or, you know, if, yeah, yeah, I think it's perfectly acceptable to say this particular format of communication is problematic for me. It triggers my attachment and aversion in a way that's not healthy for me. I'm not going to use it. In the same way someone who is a recovering alcoholic says, I'm not going to join you in the pub. Even though I want to hang out with you, it can't be there. And that's not saying it's the pub's fault, it's not the phone's fault, but we have to know ourselves as an individual, what are the conditions that don't bring out the best in us. So if someone else is making this choice, I can't have this tool because my mind uses it as a condition for suffering very easily, then we should respect it, right? That was a really good the yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Everyone is like reading. Maybe one last yeah, right. question. Yeah, one more and then we finish. Yeah. No, that was good. It was good. It's important. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was thinking about this. Uh, you talked about uh, praise and criticism and how it creates uh, suffering or agitation in the mind. And I was thinking that um, when you try, when you, if you try to stay above that sort of mm. uh, uh, 
you would so step out of the the agreed upon social yes a social play or a social yes play. and I can imagine that also creating yeah agitation in others and maybe yeah loneliness yourself like if I don't praise and criticize what will I talk yeah. about yeah. 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 Like, uh, were awakened or lightning, yeah. you probably wouldn't care anyway. Yeah. But since I'm not. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm me neither. <laughs> sort of to, uh, how, so how, if you could elaborate on how could you how could you do that without you know alienating, alienating others. Alienating yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's I mean, it's a huge question. I mean, the teaching is mainly on if praise is coming your way and criticism is coming your way, how to not get agitated by that. Because you understand people's reasons for that are very mixed and are not as they seem. So you can unhook from the need, right? People praise sometimes because of friendliness, but sometimes because they want something. They criticize sometimes because it's helpful and sometimes because they're suffering and mean. You know, there's mixed reasons for both. I don't need to get hooked. Right. So that's one side of the teaching. The other side is how we communicate as an individual. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to play with your conversations with people a little bit and experiment with, if you listen to other people really, really deeply, sometimes they will come out with an interesting insight or a beautiful idea that then you can sort of take and give back to them. Normally, we latch on to what we relate to easily. So if someone is going on and on about a politician we don't like, if, if we also don't like them, it's very easy to go, yeah, yeah, what's more? I heard this about him and this about him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's so easy to have a conversation about that because you have that in common, right? It's an easy place to connect. But there are still other places to connect. So if you kind of make a project of how can I listen for other points of connection within what this person is saying. And so you're listening to them differently, like, okay, criticism there. Okay, still issues with their partner there. Oh, workplace drama, yep. Do, do, do. Oh, cool idea about environment. Yes, more on that. Cool idea about being nice to siblings. Yeah, whatever, right? But you're listening for something that is positive, and then you go with that. You relate to that. Does it make sense? Right, so you're not trying to change them. You're trying to shine a light on the best part of them and bring it to the surface. And some people will be noticing that you're talking differently or responding differently, but a lot of people are too self-centered to notice, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? And so if you're doing this experiment, they maybe won't feel like you're a weirdo. They'll just sort of start having better conversations and wonder why they're so happy, right? Occasionally, people will be like, you've changed. You don't, you know, do you think you're better than me? You don't talk about people and they'll get all funny and defensive. That'll happen. Make fun of yourself. Know that you're not perfect and just be like, yep. Yeah, you know, but a lot of people won't even notice, honestly. <laughs> they won't. So, so it's just listening to people differently, then you can respond differently. And you're not trying to change them, you're trying to bring the best out of them. And at the very least, not bring the worst out of yourself. Do you know what I mean? So, so you're quite right, it does make you a little out of sync with the normal human conversation especially in certain areas. But if you make it kind of a fun project and don't beat yourself up when you slide into old patterns, just any time you can lift the conversation rather than pull it down, any time you can sort of move it in a way that's kind of more constructive, it's, it's nice to try. And if you fail, you just let it go, you know. Um, but it's, it's an interesting thing to play with because also it makes you less lazy in a conversation because we do get kind of lazy. We just go with the easiest place to link. Yeah, I don't like that politician either. Ah, oh, easy. Yeah. Oh, that one guy at work. Yeah, let's talk about him. Ah, uh, <laughs> easy, right? But you know, if you can kind of challenge yourself to go deeper, it can encourage that in other people. Do you, um, do you have any uh, recommendations for any references uh, uh, within a Buddhist perspective on communication? So yeah, communication. This is a good one. I should have one on the tip of my tongue, and I don't. Does anyone else think of a Buddhist communication book that is your favorite? Or teacher, or talk, or whatever. 
I, you know, I very much like um, Pema Chodron. Um, yeah, she's, she's got some very interesting ways, mostly about inner communication, which then would ripple out as outer communication, but very skillful. Um, you know, Alan Wallace has very interesting ideas about the mind, but it's not so much how that translates into outer communication. Honestly, the best person is His Holiness the Dalai Lama. <laughs> really. Um, I mean... What's the, what's the name you said before? Oh, Alan Wallace? Alan Wallace is very interesting. What, what's tricky about the Dalai Lama is that he speaks with a Tibetan accent and he's a cute old man. Don't let that fool you. He is a master at relating to anyone. If you see a public talk with him or like a panel of him with quantum physicists and psychotherapists and, you know, sports people and comedians, he is the master of relating to anyone. So if you can find yourself some fun podcast with a panel discussion, he, just by example, like I was thinking I was at one panel and some um, neuroscientist was talking about all these things about the mind that Buddhism discovered thousands of years ago, right? And this, this neuroscientist was saying it like it was brand new, exciting knowledge, you know? And, you know, all us Buddhists are like, quite true. And, you know, and, but what His Holiness did is he just said, wonderful. He didn't have to prove that he knew that already. He didn't have to put him down. He just wonderful, you know. And I thought that's the way to communicate, right? Yeah, like this. So anyway, <laughs> all right. Have a good night, everyone. Okay, <laughs>